Hey everybody, and welcome to Rider Club Radio Spoiler Cast 3, Common Rider Kuga Spoiler Cast. I'm your host, Jeff. And I'm Liam. And today we're not going to be talking about Common Rider Ghost Episode 13 because it didn't get released. Nope, not until next week. So this time around we're going to be talking around Common Rider Kuga, which is a series starring Onadera Yusuke as he travels from world to world with our hero, Common Rider Decade. He mostly acts as Decade's sidekick, and continually gets his ass beat in order to make the other characters seem stronger. How do you feel about this character, Liam? It's a very iconic series, it's a very iconic character, really a classic, uh, really brought Kamen Rider into a new age, very strong, loved it, 10 out of 10. It's, it's the first Kamen Rider series ever, it was Absolutely. released in 2010. <laughs> Starring a writer called, like, A.U. Kuga? I'm not really sure what the AU stood for. I think it was like a, a new thing that Ryder was doing in that day. I know what the A stands for. What's that? Awesome. Awesome Ultimate Kuga. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. My favorite character is Onadera Yusuke. My favorite character is Decade. Wow, you have shit taste, Liam. So Jeff, we're gonna before we get into actually talking about the real meat of Kuga, before we get into the real plot details, the real spoilers. Why don't you give us, we'll both give like a little overview. What did you think of Kuga overall? Maybe we should probably actually talk about the real Kamen Rider Kuga. Yeah, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I figured people would realize that that was a fake. We're not going to be talking about Decade. If you were tricked, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not a smart one. No, you are not a smart person. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of Kuga, Jeff? Do you like it? Do you hate it? What? Kuga is one of my favorite series. Not just in Kamen Rider, but ever. Ooh, like favorite I, TV of all time. Yeah, one of my favorite TVs. Well, TV is shit usually, so yeah, it stands TV's head and just started to become good these days. And even then, it's like picking little things out that are that are pretty good. Yeah, it's very very hit or miss. Yeah. Even in the shows that are good. Yeah, even good shows tend to have really shitty things about them. But we're not talking about TV in general tonight. We're talking about Kuga, motherfucker. I love I love Kuga. I love uh, a lot of the characters in Kuga, and a lot of Kamen Rider series, whenever somebody is on screen that isn't a rider, I'm uh, bored to tears. Okay. Because they're there to fill time until the action scene happens. Yeah. At least in a lot of, like, newer stuff. Yeah. And that's a big complaint that people have about newer series, is that the secondary characters don't seem to add anything to the series besides being a damsel in distress, or... Just existing? Yeah, sometimes they give the hero some shit, but like they don't have arcs, generally, in the newer series. No. That was one of the things that Kuga did, I think, strongest and better than most other Rider series, is that it keeps using its characters for the whole whole breadth of the series. Even Tsubaki, like a, who is the, that doctor, the throwaway character who could have been... The, he could have just been once, oh, he's got a, a belt in him, and then just leave him. But they keep bringing him back, because every time the belt keeps growing and changing, and they keep bringing the doctor back, and he's trying to go on dates, and he... he <laughs> 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 he's got like a life he feels like a real character and and he didn't really have many arcs but there were there were other Enokita was one of my favorites how, there's a whole subplot that, that lies under so much of the show how she's trying to reconnect with her son and she's yeah. too much of a workaholic she's got to keep making the bullets and stuff and she's she's doesn't have enough time to be a mother. And that is a good that is a good payoff and includes other characters that you wouldn't imagine being included as well. Like Jean becomes a part of that storyline. When mostly he's just been showing up and saying, Hello. <laughs> you see, good morning. And then he speaks in perfect <laughs> Japanese for the rest of the Yeah, the characters sort of interact with each other and they, they do stuff throughout the whole series. I don't know if I like Kuga as much as you like Kuga, Jeff. I think Kuga is very, very good. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy you it a lot. You have a problem with the episodic meat in the center of the two delicious artisan buns that yeah. are the beginning and end of the series. I talk a lot about Black and how, how Black is like the show of formula at its best. And I, I, I mm. stick true to that. And I think Kuga is that same show of formula close to its best. And it's like, it's not that... It's like Kuga's show of formula, but it's also like a J-drama over top of yeah, it. Yeah, and I think that J-drama over top of it adds to it a lot. It's oh, yeah. just that the show of formula is something that, like, I'm not a huge fan of. I'm not the biggest fan of it, unless the action is really good. You know, the problem with the show of formula is that, like, we're shotgunning these shows. Mm. We're not, like... Going into them thinking, well, I'm going to watch this once a week and get some cool action and then move on. Yeah. We're looking for, like, deep 
introspective stories that continue episode to episode, and that's not the way the series is really supposed to be viewed. Yeah, that's true. We're probably coming at like the entire Common Rider series the wrong way. For that. <laughs> except for <laughs> except for the currently airing series. But I think um even Black I enjoyed more uh, around its middle section just because the action and the special effects are so good in Black. The action's like far more polished, I would say, in Black, and that's like a tick in Kuga's box for me in a way. In a different way, I guess, because I love the action in Black. But the more down-to-earth, realistic tone that Kuga has... I mean, there's monsters, there's transforming from form to form. But the way all of it is laid out is very, like... If there was a common Rider, this is what it would be like. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was watching Kuga, I was around the midpoint, and I was like, wow, this is the most realistic Rider series I've ever seen. The police actually get involved and do stuff. And they talk about uh, like uh, how, how, how the monsters affect society and things like that, and how... Uh, the cops are constantly having meetings, and they're like, oh my god, what do we do about this shit? We, we, we make these bullets. And Even the way the characters interact is far more realistic than in most other series. Like, nobody just decides not to tell all the other characters pertinent information that causes nothing but problems for, like, 12 episodes. <laughs> there's, no, there's no dumb forced shit. No. There is and the J-drama. Characters, and the characters interact in a very realistic manner. Like, they're all focused on this one guy. Yeah. So they all end up crossing paths because of it, and getting to know each other. And in... yeah, there there is J drama, but it's not dumb. It's not overly forced. And I thought that was like I said before in in the middle part of the season where it starts to slow down. The drama was more of the draw for me. Yeah, it's a character driven series in that way. Yeah, like the plot itself stalls pretty heavily, but I feel like the character driven portion of it really picks up during that part. Absolutely. So that's our overall thoughts about Kuga. It's a good series. It has many strengths. It has a few weaknesses with pacing. I yeah, think. Yeah, it's not it's not perfect, and that's usually what people's biggest problem. Yeah. is with the series is that it ends up being very episodic. Yeah, people. Uh, it's a really clunky nickname I hear given to it as Sloga. God, that's it awful. sounds really stupid, but it's not wrong. It's a slow moving show in the middle, and that's <laughs> it's one of the reasons why it took me a million quadrillion years to finish. It sounds like a fucking cartoon horn slow. <laughs> That's the best I can do, folks. It's well, you did good. It's a very stupid word. It's hard. It's a hard word to work with. <laughs> Trying to put some jokes in the podcast. You tried it real hard. You tried real hard. So that's our overall, like, just quick opinions about the show. If you don't want spoilers, this is a spoiler cast. So I'm a little confused about what you want from us, <laughs> but you can turn it off now, and you'll avoid all the spoilers. Yeah, from like here the on. Fact. That Kuga dies. Oh, that's a fake one, don't worry. That is a fake spoiler. But from here on... Or from, is it? From this exact time code on, you are no longer safe. If you don't want to hear spoilers, please skip to this time code. Turn the podcast off, you gotta fuck it! So we can get into the meat and potatoes of this series now. Okay. The specifics. Okay. When you when you watched Kuga's beginning, when you first saw like that first that first like arc or the first few arcs, the whole first act, the setting up. What did you think of that bit, Jeff? Did you think? Because I thought it was the strongest part of the series. Yeah, I did too. When I first started out, Kuga was not the first series that I'd seen. Mm-hmm. I'd seen a few beforehand. So I was I was a little bit worried, because I'd seen Ryuki before Kuga, and I was a little bit worried that uh, Godai was going to end up being a Shinji-type character, like an idiot who gets shit on the whole series. Oh, yeah. Because he's he's really goofy, Godai is. But he's far more, like, warm-hearted and friendly, mm-hmm. instead of just being, like, uh, I don't brain-damaged. <laughs> what would you call Shinji? Shinji was um, Shinji was a goof. He was an idiot. Yeah. They they try to set him up as like, oh, he likes to gather data, and that's his thing, and then they just drop it real quick, and he's just yeah, a dummy. He's, he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but Kuga is like, I guess since we're talking about the intro, we're talking about character setup in the first arc. We can talk about Godai a little. Yeah. Because Godai, I think, is a big draw in this series, and I think he's he's one of the reasons why people like him so much. They're right because Goda is a really great character and he's not he's not a, a terribly realistic character I no, wouldn't say No he's he's very much like an idealized type yeah. of character like a cartoon 
kind of person. He's not the guy you are, he's the guy you want to be. Yeah, he's just a really, really great guy. And I've heard people level complaints at this series saying, oh, he's like a Mary Sue. I've heard that thrown around in many places as well, yeah. But he's like a complete weirdo. Did you not see the series? <laughs> He's like, everyone who meets him to begin with is very off-put by him and has to warm up to him. And he does things that no normal human being should ever do. Like, he sneaks into a, uh... He sneaks into that, uh, archaeological dig Yeah, the site. archaeological yeah, dig the site. Cops he just at. sneaks in with cops everywhere. Like, no human being would ever do that. That's one of my favorite, because this the show sets up Godai so well. It introduces you to him so well. At first, you have that scene... That uh, guy I'm completely ripped off where he helps the crying child find his mom. Yeah. And he, like, juggles for him. And then you have the bit where he sneaks into the dig site, and he's... <laughs> the way he does it is he just, he just like, power walks past the cops, and he's like, Oh, sorry, I'm late, boss. I'll get right to work. And they're like, Oh, hang on, you motherfucker. <laughs> he's, he's a huge goofball. He's not a Mary Sue because the characters don't start out all sucking his dick. He has to prove himself continually to every character he meets throughout the show. The only character that starts out all about him is uh, Nana, Nana the, the little girl. waitress yeah. at the tea shop. I remember Ichijo, when they first meet, Ichijo says, like, you, you might be a superhero, Kuga, but you can't, like, you can't just run around like an idiot. You have to be 100% in on it. You have to, like, he doesn't immediately trust him. He doesn't immediately... I think he's the best man for the job. No, he tells him he can't get involved with police business to begin with, straight yeah. up. He says, look, this is not your concern. I don't care what you have to say about it, who brought you in, what kind of belt you have fused your spinal cord. You're not allowed. <laughs> and Godai does it anyway. Yeah. And Ichijo, like, rips him a new asshole. He, like, chews him out. Yeah, and that's he what he says. He doesn't like him don't... at all to begin with. Like, it's serious business. We can't have an idiot involved and you getting shot at and possibly fucking everything up. So it's 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 a it's a building of trust. And the scene I think in the church in the burning church where Kuga finally decides to fight and when he first turns into uh mighty form, I believe they don't name the forms in the actual show, but it's Mighty Dragon Titan and Pegasus. Yeah, it's Mighty Form that he transforms into in the church. That is a fantastic scene when they're fighting the bat yeah, it monster. It really is. And it's it's that like, okay, fucking Kuga's here. The show's begun. It's 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 all I actually on. really like that he had like the growing form to begin with. Yeah. And he struggled to be able to learn how to go beyond that form. He wasn't strong enough. He kept losing. And that was a really great introduction to the power of being Kuga. Yeah. He it took him so long because he was growing. Uh eh. The way I think about Kuga in my head, his character, not like his powers or anything, and this might be a statement that I don't know if you'll agree with it, Jeff, but I, I think he's kind of something like a Japanese Superman kind of character, where, like, he's he's not, like I said, he's not realistic, he's just this 100%, like, down-to-earth, he's nice, He's he just wants to help everyone. And you like watching him because of that. You can't, like, he's he's not real, he's not terribly relatable, he's not like, um... Like Kagami, where like you see him and he's just like an office schlub, and you're like, oh, I like that guy. He's like a he's a relatable guy. He's a loser, just like me. But you look at it's Kuga, something to, um, it's something to aspire to. Really. Yeah, you, like he's a character that's made to inspire you to try to be a better person. Yeah, and he he's fun to watch because he's so he's just, he's this shining light in this violent, awful world full of monsters and evil. He's yeah. he's the one in the middle. Who is, is, is... He, he has to like, struggle as well. He isn't just handed all this power on a silver platter and just mows through everybody as it goes along. He struggles physically, emotionally, and spiritually as the series gets towards its end. Mm -hmm. I remember... With the weight of what he has to deal with and what he's becoming. Yeah, he falters a couple times. I remember there's uh, the porcupine, the famous porcupine arc when he finds out all the students are being killed and there's like, there's, like two 10th grade students left in the school... And he is so fucking pissed off, and he he's he doesn't act like his usual like happy go lucky self. He doesn't goof around. He fucking punches the shit out of the porcupine until he's bleeding on the ground, and then he stabs him with the sword, and then he blows up. It's a great arc, and there's another one later on. I don't remember exactly which arc it is, but he's looking at a TV, and it's it's listing off the victims of a recent Grongi attack, and it's like all these like like it's like fucking like 150 people, and he's like he's like pissed off and his fist is all clenched and he's, he's, he's nervous and it's, I think it's, um, it's Daguva that's done it. It's like the final arc of the series 
and he's really upset. You can tell he's upset, and then someone comes in the room, and he turns around, and he puts that smile on, because he's fucking Kuga, and he knows that if he, if he falters, if he says, oh, I don't know if I can do this, then everyone's gonna think all hope is lost. He, he, he does it for everyone else. He, he fights for everyone's smiles, not just physically, but with his, with his whole demeanor. You know, I wasn't really on the same page as you when you started out this, like, comparison to Superman. Mm. Because you used, uh, the logic that everybody tends to use with Superman is that he's not relatable. Mm-hmm. And I mean, powers-wise, nobody knows what the hell it's like to be like that. Yeah. But responsibilities-wise, I think we all have had, like, really weighty responsibilities on our shoulders before. Mm-hmm. And there's the whole side of Superman, the Clark Kent side, that's just a dude who got, who found out he was a fucking alien at some point. <laughs> And yeah. I, that's the Superman I enjoy, the guy who's like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I was just plowing a field the other day. What is this? <laughs> and I think there's a lot of that in Kuga as well. He was just some, like, goofy dude who liked to make people smile. You can't even say he's, and, like, a farmer or anything. He's just some freeder. He lives with his uncle. That's all he yeah. does. <laughs> He's just he's just a freeloader. Yeah, you're right. How many writers actually have jobs? You know, um, a lot of Showa writers have jobs, not, and there are a lot of early Heisei writers, all the way up to... I don't even think Decade actually has a job. They list him as photographer, but he doesn't like, get paid for it. Yeah, I'm sure he's not even freelance or anything. The, he just, there's a he's... ton of just, like, freeloaders. <laughs> I know Ryuki was a journalist. That one was obvious. But Kuga's got nothing. Hagito's got nothing. Uh, does Fies have anything? Um, I don't think Fies has a job. You know, Blade is a is a company man. Being oh, a writer is his job. That's kind of cool. Kind of like Drive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, Post decade, a lot of writers have jobs. Yeah. Except O's. Oz is a hobo. <laughs> he owns one pair of underpants. Oh, all he wants is clean underpants. Well, he has to. He's only got the one. <laughs> That's a big concern. Oh. Yeah, I yeah, love... Yeah, Kug- Kuga's a... Godai's a freeloader. He just accidentally... Well, actually, it's not an accident. He, he grabs chooses it. to put the belt on so that he can protect people, because not even knowing what it is. Because he's a real motherfucking hero. He doesn't He doesn't second-guess himself. He sees a chance and he takes it. That's why he's you like, like him. He's kind of, like, brainless in a way. Yeah. He, he runs entirely on emotion. Yeah. And that's why he's Ichijo not, doesn't trust him. He's not particularly clever. Yeah. Well, we're digging real far into Godai. How the fuck did he afford those trips that he always went on? I don't he, know. He, like, tours <laughs> Europe and backpacks through Ireland and shit like that. And look, he doesn't have a fucking job. He's freeloading off his uncle. What is this? He just take his uncle's profits? And... Yeah, his un- he's like, hey, uncle, I'm going to go to Cambodia. <laughs> I'm going to take a trip to Indonesia. Just give me the money. <laughs> I just, he's like, yo, I just, like, your profits from the last month, I just took, like, three quarters of them going to Brazil. See you in three weeks, <laughs> fucker. He goes to the uh, airport by himself and just gives people thumbs up as they go past until eventually they uh, buy a ticket. <laughs> oh, the iconic thumbs up. Every, in the last episode of the series, everyone gives everyone else a thumbs up. Of course. They've all learned from Godai. We'll talk about the last episode a little later. What do you think about Godai's foil, Ichijo? Ichijo starts out as a character that I uh, that I really, really identified with more than Godai. Because Godai made the dumbest decisions you could possibly make <laughs> at the beginning of the series. And it led him to becoming Kuga, so it was all the right decisions. In the end, yeah. In the end. But Ichijo's like, what the fuck are you doing? Are you stupid? <laughs> you can't just jump into the police business and, like, start punching monsters? Yeah. What's wrong with you? And eventually, he warms up to Godai and starts doing everything in his power to make sure that Kuga's capable of fighting these monsters. He understands, long before the rest of the police division, whatever, understands that Kuga's the only hope they have. Yeah, they don't have... Like, the bullets they get, I think they, they get bullets later that stun them, but they don't have actual bullets that can kill them until, like, fucking the 40s or something, way, way yeah. later. And even then, they don't really they don't do get much. much use out of that them. That part where he fucking shoots B1, 
Yeah. He just fucking empties his goddamn revolver into her, and she just falls in a river. That was one of my favorite. That's why, I think that's why a lot of people call Ichijo a secondary rider, in a way, because he does shit a lot. He gets shit yeah. done despite not having a belt. Ichijo just fucking blows her out with his gun. Yeah. Just shoots her. That was awesome. It was fucking great. A lot of secondary riders don't get to do that shit. Yeah. They exist to get their asses beat to make the main rider look good. And here's <laughs> Ichijo without even a belt just shooting a monster to death. He, he he really knew what was up. And he was actually helpful a lot of the time. He had a, that rifle and he would always put the special bullets in it and he knew what to do. He would investigate, and he would direct Kuga to know where to go and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, he was like Kuga's brains, really. He was the man behind the hero. He like, was Kuga's not an idiot. Godai's not stupid or anything. He just, he doesn't think very often. He runs on instinct and emotion. So Ichijo being there for him, being like his partner, is the balance. Plus he's it's... like, he's like the straight man. Yeah. You know, Godai's really goofy, and Ichijo is like a company man. He's like a... He's, he's a very, like, kind of stodgy policeman. He, he follows the procedure. And we're making Godai seem like uh, he does over-the-top goofy shit, like later writers. Like, he's not Shotaro. Yeah. He's not, like, making goofy faces and screaming and stuff. Like, the humor is really uh, subtle in this series. I, maybe not as subtle as, like, Downton Abbey humor. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that show's about. But it's not, like... Running around tripping and hitting people with shoes. Double had a lot of humor. It usually just comes from Godai just being a, a weird kind of guy. Yeah, he's just, he's a weirdo. Yeah, bit of a weirdo. And it's funny, <laughs> especially because Ichijo is 100% serious. He's not later Heisei serious where he overreacts to everything. And if for a comedic if effect, it was a post, he reacts like a normal person. If it was like a post, if it was like something I made around Kabuto era... Or something like that, and Ichijo was the secondary rider. He would probably be trying to kill Godai, like from episode ten onward, or something like that, for some inane reason. That's probably true. But no, Kuga is one of the reasons. The whole show is one of the reasons why I like early Heisei so much, pre-decade Heisei, or like you know, first few seasons of Heisei. I think it's strong, and Kuga is a very strong showing at the beginning of it. Oh yeah, that's what made you decide to start watching Agito next. Yeah, I have watched Agito. I'll talk about that later, though. Ichijo is a really great character. He's a really he's he's the perfect foil for Kuga. Yeah, he really is. And their partnership is the core of the series. Like what they accomplish together as characters. Well, that's what you want to see. They they have they have separate um casts almost to begin with and they start to intermingle as it goes along. Yeah, there's the cops and there's the the Kuga and his friends and his sister and his his uh Sakurako, the translator. Yeah, it's like Kuga and all the people he knows, and Ichijo and all the people he knows. Yeah. And eventually they become, like, one unit as time goes on, almost. Yeah, they start intermingling and talking to each other and, and you know, pooling their resources towards the end. Which is really cool to see. And that happens in a lot of other series, but there's always still somebody who's like, I'm only working with you because I have to. <laughs> they fight and they say the classic line, don't get in my way in this fight. <laughs> you watch watch uh, like a Japanese show for kids, like a shonen anime or like a Kamen Rider series or something like that that has a character like that, and count how many times they say don't get in my way in the beginning of a fight. Mm, that's true. It's like, you don't have enough fingers, motherfucker. If you do a drinking game, you'll be like, dead. <laughs> the main character is always like, dickhead secondary character, we're working towards the exact same fucking goal <laughs> in the exact same way. We should work together. And they're like, no, I have different goals somehow. <laughs> Spectre! <laughs> don't get in my way. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, I had a terrible coughing fit right there. That was terrible. Liam, Ooh. do you have a cold? I Yeah, I must be coming down with something. It's so cold up here all the time in Canada. In Canada land. In, in Canada, the snowboy land. What? Snow land. Okay. Kuga's first arc is really good at setting up its characters, and is very good at setting up the situation. It's it's uh, the Grongi are a very strong part of Kuga, and they're they're a good showing because the show is not afraid to have them fucking murder innocent oh, people God. by the hundreds. The, the body count in Kuga is so far above every other body count in every other series. It's, like you said, you told me when I was starting Kuga. In most other Rider series, the monsters will come out and they'll be like, oh, we're going to get this this one guy or something. They'll go after one guy, and then just as they get to him, the Rider will interrupt them. In Kuga, it's like, 
Yo, Kuga, there's a guy on the other side of town, there's a monster on the other side of town, he's killed, like, 600 people, and you should probably get there soon, because he's gonna kill another 150, and, uh, it's yeah, looking pretty rough. The monster shows up and starts fucking killing people. He doesn't just knock over plastic furniture and rage for a while, waiting for the hero to get there. Yeah, exactly. He shows up and starts killing people, and Godai's, like, in fucking Queens, and he needs <laughs> to get to the Bronx. <laughs> I think we've had this, dis- I mean, this we've had this discussion before, and that's why the cops give him such a fucking fast motorbike because they're like, you need yeah. to get there before the deaths get into the triple digits, Kuga. You need to get there fast. In pretty much every other rider series, like the monster starts attacking, and the rider just jumps the fuck into frame. Yeah, immediately. Yeah, because they don't want to like they don't want to make it seem like a lot of people are dying. I guess it upsets the childs and their mothers. Yeah, maybe. This is the only show. I don't know if any other writer series have, have have done it. I don't know, but this is the only one I've seen where a kid dies on screen. There's a bit uh. um, later towards the end of the series where there's like some uh, Grongi who's got like a double sword and she walks around with a double sword and she cuts people's heads off with it. She just walks up to you and cuts your head off. And she cuts off the head of a mother and her child, and you see the kids, like, the, she walks past the kid and she cuts him, and then the kid falls, and you don't see his head, but you see, like, his foot twitching on the ground as he hits the ground, and oh I was like, I saw that, I was like, holy shit, like, this is a show they for children. A kid. Yeah, this is a show for, like, what, like, 8 to 12 year olds? Like, Jesus, fuck. You can't even do that shit in Manhunt. <laughs> It's, 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 <laughs> but it's so good at getting you against the Gronky because, again, oh, yeah. just like Kuga, they're not uh, entirely realistic villains. They're not, they don't have a complex motivation. They just kill they're, people for fun. It's, it's a Their hunt. motivation is that they're having a game to yeah. see who can kill the most people. And I guess that's sort of a realistic motivation when you think about it. Because the Grongi think that humans are just like cattle. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like a. So it would be like going out in the woods and having a competition to see who can kill the most turkeys. Yeah, I suppose you're going out on a quail hunt, except the quail yeah. are people, and it makes you hate the Grongi so fucking much. Like the they're like you see innocent people dying on screen all the time, and it's a it's a good hammer home. It's a bit of a cheap way to do it, but it works very well. It's effective. It gets you rooting for Kuga. The Grongi are actually kind of terrifying as well because they don't. There's no rhyme or reason to how they kill people. They just show up and start murdering people. Like, people are just having, like, a picnic. <laughs> or they're walking to the store, and then a fucking monster mash shows up and cuts their goddamn head off. Well, that's that's the thing I like about them. There is a rhyme or reason, but it's very cryptic. It's like, yeah. they'll, they'll do a, a location that starts with Do, and then a location that starts with Ray, and then Me, and then Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, or just something weird like that. Or, like, they'll kill people wearing blue. Or just, like, they just pick a random thing... And it's it's not like they're trying to kidnap a scientist to build them a super bomb or something. They're just, no. they're just oh, what's that? You're in a pool? All right, you're fucking dead, mate. Yeah, Everyone they in this care pool that little about human life, yeah. which makes <laughs> yeah. you hate them even more. Yeah, everything set up in Kuga in the first arc is is great. It's it's one of my favorite. I think my my favorite first arc in any Kamen Rider series. It's it it. it Gets, it sets up the dastardly villains, it sets up all the side characters, it sets up the main character very well and his whole situation and why you like him. The villains feel a lot more dastardly in that way. Yeah. I mean, think about the roid mutes. They just, they show up and they make people move slow and then they blow things up. <laughs> there was the bit in the Global Freeze segment where they, they kick a giant bowling ball and kill like 20 people. That was pretty fucked yeah. up. But beyond that, uh, Drive's a pretty bloodless show, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think about the dopants in Double. I mean, you haven't seen Double, but the dopants are just regular criminals who use their dopant power to do more crimes. Yeah, to rob banks and shit. Yeah, and like get revenge on people or whatever, <laughs> and they always get stopped. Okay. And you understand their motivations immediately. But for a huge chunk of Kuga, you don't know what the fuck they're doing or why. They don't even speak a language you understand. Yeah, and then, uh, that's thing number two that Gaim stole from the show, is the language. They, they gradually, slowly, but surely learn, learn Japanese, but when they're in private early on, they just speak this, this gibberish language. And there is a translation. It's like a cipher for Japanese. Yeah, it's like a cipher from Grongi to Japanese, and then you have to know Japanese to be able to understand. Yeah, so forget that. But, like, they, yeah. they speak about their plans in grongi ease, and you don't know what, what the hell it is. That's, like, a big... It's a big part of Kuga. You're not supposed to really get what they're what they're doing. So it makes them a little more mysterious. It's kind of... 
I think that's one of the weaknesses. It's a bit of a letdown that their motivation is just we do it for fun. But at the same time, it's like you're expect for, for fun exactly. It's like it a ritual like a thing. It's it's like a ritual to see which tribe becomes the new leader. Yeah, the Gegeru, the the the, the one yeah. to see who is the strongest. But like at the same time, it's it's like you expect there to be some grand design behind it all. And it's like, it, it betrays your expectations in that way. It makes them seem more all right. monstrous. I think it was alright for yeah. me. I didn't really, I didn't think that they were going to have some grand reason behind it or anything. I just, I mean, I I thought it was just going to be like a game for fun when they started talking about it as a game. Yeah. And the fact that it actually had a reason behind the game was more than I even expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Grongi are a good part of Kuga. They're, they're... Yeah, the Grongi are really good, and you get, like, a part two of that in the Lords in Agito. Oh, I'm... Their motivation is very cryptic don't, as well. Don't spoil Agito, I gotta watch Agito. I'm not gonna spoil Agito. <laughs> Agito is a very, like, good successor series to Kuga. It builds on everything Kuga did right, fixes a lot of the problems with the pacing that Kuga had, but it feels a bit like a retread, so it never goes above Kuga's level. Mm. Well, I'm excited to watch it. I, I, well, I, I love Agito, by the way. Like, yeah. I, I would actually put Agito and Kuga on even footing. Ooh. I like them both a lot. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people saying Agito is fucking fantastic. I'm excited to keep going. But we're not talking about Agito. We're not talking about Agito. I, maybe I'll talk about the first episode later, after we're done with Kuga, but... Yeah. Uh, That'd be fine. Another thing I really like about Kuga's early arcs is how he gets the powers, how he gets them right when he needs them, the new uh, the new forms, and then you find out, you think, like, oh, it's so convenient, but there is a reason for it later, in that, like, the belt, it's fused with him and it responds to his needs. Yeah. And it gives him, like, if he has to see really far, he's, it turns into Titan, and then later on he can sort of do it at will. But, like, it's a neat thing to see well, him... When he needs to see really far, it turns into Pegasus. No, Pegasus is the armor form. No, that's Titan. Are you sure... Yes. Are you 100% sure? Look, look it up on the internet, buddy. All right, this is going to be... Google.com. This is going to be a live reaction to You're going to either... cut this out because you're wrong. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is going to be a live reaction to either me being right or me being wrong. Okay. Mighty Form is the red one, yeah. Yeah. Dragon Form is the blue one, yeah. Yep. Pegasus is... Oh my god, I had him mixed up. Fuck you. Who is the almighty master of Kuga? <laughs> I guess it's you, Jeff. Throughout the entire season, they never say the names of the forms. I guess no, it's just they're not. It's just they're shit they really put in the toy box. The it's, this is my blue form. Yeah, he's, this he, is my green form. That's another thing I like. He doesn't assign them these random names. He's just like, oh, I'm red. Oh, I'm blue. Oh, I'm green. I, I love his reactions. He's like, oh, I'm blue. What does that mean? <laughs> and when he's talking about them, he's like, that guy's pretty far away. But if I turn green, I could probably see him. Like, yeah. it's, it's like it's it's like what an actual person would talk about being a superhero. He's like, I'll just turn green now. Like, he doesn't try to put yeah. some dumb name to it. A person who hasn't already seen superhero materials. Yeah, someone who doesn't watch Common Rider. I feel like we're at a point right now that, like, make if you make a movie where somebody becomes a superhero. They should already know what a superhero is. Yeah, it's actually kind of aggravating, and especially like zombie shit. Where, like, zombies show up and people are like, oh my god, what are these things? <laughs> it's, Let's it takes call place, them walkers. They take place in a world exactly like our own, except nobody has ever made a piece of zombie media ever in history. What a perfect world. I, <laughs> <laughs> I could, If I could get to that world, I could be rich. <laughs> but no, unfortunately. But Kuga's forms are treated very well. In the early game. Kuga's forms are all um, exceptionally useful. Yeah. They all have real uses beyond, like... Think of Mozart. What the fuck is Mozart's use <laughs> in Ghost? For a second I was like, think, I thought you were like, think about the composer Mozart and all the forms he took think while he was Think about Wolfgang composed. Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart almost never used his Pegasus form. It was very... <laughs> he took it for granted. <laughs> Think about it in Ghost. Yeah. His his Mozart form is... What does it do that any of his other forms can't do? He can wave his arms and hurt you without even running up to you. Like, he has three, four separate long-range forms? Yeah, but that's because nowadays... We talked about this on an earlier episode. Nowadays, Kamen Rider is a lot more about toy politics than it was back in Kuga's day. Of course, there were toys of Kuga, certainly. Yeah, that, that was, of course, like, Kuga had toys in mind. That's probably why he had so many forms. He has, like, he has like ten forms at the end of the show, but yeah. 
they but were it's just not... trying to sell action figures. They weren't trying to sell doodads that you shove into a belt. Yeah, Kuga, like, it doesn't, it's not even a belt that you put on. It's like Showa, it just appears on you when you start transforming. So it's it's less... Uh, it's Although less... ghosts and specters appear on them as well. Yeah, but most of the like newer riders, like Gaim That's actually and Drive and... the one thing I really love about the ghost belt. I love that, that too. appears. Yeah, it's a cool... It looks cool to have it like, you, you go... And it's like... It also uh, makes it so no one can take your belt. Yeah. That's which happens nice well. a lot in other Heisei series. Your belt, you can't get hit and have your belt fly off and fall into the lake next to you. It's never going to happen. You can't have your belt taken from you and your enemy transform into your rider form and then kick your ass, <laughs> Fies. <laughs> I'm, I'm legit excited to watch Fies. When I'm done Agito, I'm watching Fies. I've decided. Fi- I'm actually thinking about Fies, but I'm not thinking about Fies because <laughs> I watched enough of it that I just don't fucking. I don't want. Oh boy, I, 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 it looks cool. I watched a lot of Fies. Is the thing okay. I watched a, a little. I think I was around halfway into the series. Okay, and I was like, I cannot fucking handle this anymore. <laughs> it looks so cool. Everything I've seen of it looks so cool, and everyone yeah. tells me it's H- shit. How long do you think you could watch a series if the only thing it had going for it is that the characters' suits looked cool? You might actually like it because it has a lot of complete fucking assholes in it. Yeah, I like inter rider conflict. I like that in the show. Do you like inter rider conflict that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever and could be avoided? That with sounds one sentence. That sounds frustrating to say the it's least. Very frustrating. That sounds frustrating. But we're not talking about Fives, We're talking about <laughs> Kuga. Let's avoid getting off track. Stay on topic. What did you think of the Force Awakens, Lee? <laughs> Let's talk about Kuga's middle section. Let's talk about the weakest part of Kuga. Yeah, it is the weakest part of Kuga. For whatever that's worth. The plot the plot doling out of Kuga is notoriously well, I don't know notoriously, I don't know how how many people share this gripe, but it's very bad. It's it's you get everything early on, and you get a great first arc, and then you get a good final arc. Not as good as the first arc, but you get a you get a, a decent final arc. And then there's this like the thirty fucking episodes in the middle. Where you're like, okay, all right, what's going on? There's a Grongi, and Kuga fights it, and Enokita's got a new bullet she's got to do, and she makes the bullet, and then they shoot him with the bullet, and then Kuga kicks it, and it goes up. Ah. Kuga goes, maybe next time I'll kill another one. Maybe that's the problem in general with having such a clear-cut goal in a Kamen Rider series. His goal from episode one is kill the Grongi. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot of, like, actually, the Grongi aren't so bad. Yeah, there's... Because the they Grongi... are so fucking bad. <laughs> the Grongi aren't a very multifaceted villain. They're just cold-blooded murderers who do it for a ritual, so there's not, like, a, there's not like layers that you can peel back on them and, and have that play out as the plot goes on. It's just, like, uh, they're fucked up, we gotta kill them all start to finish, it's just, it's just them killing them all. And that's, I think, where the J-drama part comes in, and starts mm. to... I said it before, it cushions the impact of the terrible... Not Okay, it's not terrible. But it pushes... <laughs> it cushions the impact of the, the bad pacing in the middle. Tell us how you really feel. It's shit! I hate Kuga! I can't take it anymore! It's the worst! <laughs> Fuck! Anyway, it's 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 not good pacing in the middle. It's it's very no. slow. It gets it gets pretty glacial in the middle, and yeah, it's like there are two different types of stories. Uh, there's the plot driven story and the character driven story, and it switches from a plot driven story to a character driven story for like the middle thirty episodes. Yeah, it's it's, like, it's like a it's like a drama show. Like the the status quo continues while the characters grow. Internally. It's more like multiple tiny character driven stories, like placed into the into the show. Like what I I thought was one of my favorite little plot lines in the whole show is Enokita trying to connect with her son. Yeah, and that has a great playoff. And uh, Jean gets involved and tries to like because he he kind of likes Enokita. Yeah, he's and, got a thing for. Her. Oh yeah. Or uh, uh, there's little bits of Godai's teacher. Godai reuniting with his teacher is absolutely the best couple episodes in the whole show. Yeah, that's my favorite arc. Some of the best arc in, or one of the best arcs in, in Rider history is is those two with the teacher, and it doesn't have anything to do with the monster. The monster, the only thing that the monster fighting serves in that arc is, oh my god, is Godai going to make it to see his teacher on time? If he doesn't get there, the teacher's going to quit. It's stressful towards yeah, the end that, of that. <laughs> 
that steak, you give more shit about that than about the Grongi dying. You just kill it and get it over with. I want to see this. I want to see the, the drama. The scene where the teacher reveals the origin of the thumbs up, that little soliloquy he gives, is fantastic. It, it makes you want a thumbs up. And it doesn't have shit to do with the Grongi. It's it's great, but it, it, it's I think that's Kuga's real strength is they sort of they carry you through it. You start to drop once once the the plot starts to slow down and the show just fucking grabs you and they're like just do it you asshole. I think maybe I had less of a problem with the slowdown okay. than you did in general. I believe but the scientific like term is density shift. Jeff, the density want... shift. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I had less of a problem with the density shift than you did. Okay. Because uh, from an artistic standpoint, the cinematography in Kuga is fucking awesome. Oh, yeah. Like, every shot is just composed so well. And I think that's a problem I bring up a lot with uh, later Heisei shows, like, uh, Decade Onwards, maybe. <laughs> decade is a real uh, turning point. Yeah, it is. And it's like, from then on, every shot is just a wide, flat shot. You get close-ups for characters, and you get snap cuts to show to hide special effects, and that's it. Yeah, there's not a lot of exciting or interesting cinematography. There's not a lot of cool, like, moving camera moments, unless they're trying to follow someone on a motorcycle. And even then, it's just kind of a, just a straight shot of them from the side. Yeah. You get a ton of cool moving camera stuff in Kuga. Like, they use that bike to its fucking maximum. Go Ram. Yeah. Yeah. Kuga. The tri chaser and the beat chaser. Yeah. They get used like nobody's fucking business. Kuga's and one of the last riders that rides, in case you didn't know. Other riders ride, but he rides like it's he's on top of a fucking weapon. <laughs> and he like is. He's riding on a sword. When he's got that armor on it, when it's yeah. Go Ram. But he I mean, even even when he's just driving around on his fucking dirt bike, mm. it's like his dirt bike is a weapon. <laughs> he's spinning and kicking people and spinning the wheel into them. Yeah, like running over enemies. He does that a lot. Yeah, he busts through a lot of shit with that bike. He sure does. And there was even that little arc with the grasshopper grongi, the second grasshopper grongi that had a bike too. Yeah, that was cool. And they biked together. That was super awesome. There was a whole had... lot of like lancing against each other, like, yeah. dueling like knights. It was really cool. Kuga had great bike use before you get to Ryuki, where it's just like, just have them get on the bike for one shot, and then the next <laughs> shot they get off the bike. I've driven like, the bike to my location, now I'm done. <laughs> just trick them into thinking they're riding, and then we'll call them riders. Mm, Perfect. The rider war. <laughs> Shouldn't we be riding on something? Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> Kenzaki's like, oh shit, I gotta build these stupid ride shooters. <laughs> Kenzaki's in his fucking garage trying to build ride shooters out of that's, what he's got. That's why there's only like 11 riders, because he only wanted to build 11 ride shooters. That's all he had the money for. <laughs> it's a contract. I doubt all 11 riders use the ride shooters. <laughs> I bet Alternative didn't use the ride shooter. No. <laughs> asshole. He mattered so much to the plot. Oh boy, maybe when we do a Ryuki spoiler cast, I'll tell you all about Alternative Zero. But until oh then, boy. today we're talking about Kuga. The cinematography is what I'm talking about, and every new episode had some kind of new type of shot in it, compared to the previous one. Yeah. And it was visually exceptionally entertaining for me. <laughs> like, the fight scenes aren't, like, well choreographed. Like, Donnie Yen is not doing the choreography in this shit. Unfortunately. Which, uh, Donnie Yen should really do some writer choreography. That would be fucking awesome. Oh my god. I wish more uh, people from other industries would get into writer. Because it, it really shakes shit up. Donnie Yen can learn... He knows both English and Mandarin and whatever other Chinese language there is. Cantonese? Cantonese. I think he could learn Japanese and get in writer as well. You're smart. You're smart, Donnie. Give us a call. G give us a call. We we'll know you're listening. Up. We'll hook you up with... John Toei. Yeah, we got a direct link to old John. <laughs> we'll set you guys up on a lunch date. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. The choreography isn't anything, home to, isn't anything to write home about, but it's... Ain't no show a series. It's very entertaining, and Kuga has a lot of weight to his motions, and the yeah. fighting gets brutal sometimes. Oh, yeah. Like, there's a shot that gets a lot of webums made of it, 
of uh, Kuga getting impaled through the shoulder. Oh, that one. And the he water gets monster. stuck to the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some shit, man. Yeah, I like that. It's it's uh, Kuga's action is pretty raw. Yeah, shit. People get bled. People who get punched. It's, it's very it's, realistic. Yeah, it's it's like I said. It's another thing that adds to like this is the most realistic rider series you've ever seen. It's, it's very grounded for a show about karate bugman. Yeah, there's a lot of handy cam in it that gives a lot of like kinetic motion. The shaky, and, yeah, yeah. It's almost like kind of like a behind the scenes kind of. Th- well, not like behind the scenes, like a documentary. Like style. you like watching a documentary. Like yeah. you're, you're seeing it as if you're there, and it's not shaky cam like a modern movie where they cut between seven thousand cuts. Yeah. And shake the camera. It's uh it's just handheld camera and the um cameraman is moving throughout the scene. It's very cool. It is very cool and the locations that they shoot at are always really interesting. It's not just the same locations that's been in every other rider series. Yeah, the one I the one repeated location from Kuga I can remember is the Grongi Museum. Or no, yeah. it's the Grongi like aquarium yeah. that they hang out in and drive. That was a nice little thing. Like, I love the fight scene, I, f- I, f- I think it's with the first Grasshopper, that takes place in the abandoned train station. Oh, no, the first Grasshopper, I think, was in an apartment complex, and he, like, jumps all the way up it from, like, the oh, center yeah, of the courtyard. Oh, yeah, he jumps from the top down and keeps hitting him. Yeah, that's Who when he gets dragged. on the train tracks? I think it was then. the Rhino on the train tracks? Maybe, but that was, like, a really awesome scene. Yeah. Just visually, it's very interesting. Like, story-wise, the plot doesn't come out. It's like a, it's a drip. We made that comment a lot with Drive, but it's like, the pipes are kind of frozen. Drip. It, yeah, with Cougar. <laughs> the way he gets the rising forms is very cool. That was something that happened in the middle that I was very interested in, how he gets fucking murdered. Oh, yeah. And they hit him with the shocks, and he, like, the, the belt is energized by the electricity, and it's like, it's a neat upgrade, because it's like something that the belt was never supposed to have. They didn't have electricity back then. Yeah. I guess you get hit by a bolt of lightning or something, but like, it... it it, like, jolts the belt to life, and it, oh, you're fucking golden now, you're a badass. The only problem I have with it is he gets he gets shocked, he gets the new forms, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And then when it's time for Ultimate Kuga, he's like, oh, how do I get Ultimate Kuga? Just fucking shock me again. Just mm. shock me a lot this time. And they're like, well, I mean, okay. That's a natural progression. That <laughs> would be the first thing I would try. That's true, but it should have been something cool, like he grabs some power lines or something. Just do it with something a little different with yeah, it. Yeah, grabbing power lines would have been a really good way. Go and then a, you could do a cool like shot where you the have whole all city the lights in the city power. go out. Yeah. He takes it all for, for the belt. That would just, have been pretty fucking sweet. To save them all. That would have been awesome. But it, it was a bit of a lame thing. It, it was... Eh, not I guess a in a way it was like his friends were helping him as well. Yeah, it's it's another... Which I guess is very Japanese. <laughs> it's very Kuga to have the characters keep being there and keep helping throughout the whole series. It's something that, that, that writers should do more. I have, a, I have a quick question. Okay. Do you think, in your infinite wisdom, okay. that Sakurako had a thing for Godai? Maybe that Sakurako had a thing for Godai, but never that Godai had a thing for Sakurako. I think Godai saw her 100% as a friend. I don't think yeah. he has that sort of capacity in him. Like we've talked about before, Godai's like a giant man-child. Yeah. He, he doesn't... I could not imagine him in any sort of romantic relationship. <laughs> <laughs> he's He's like... I can imagine girls taking to him. He's handsome, he's charismatic, he's pretty fit. Like, Nana seems all about him. Well, Nana's like 14, though, so fuck her. She's... Uh... Yeah, she doesn't care. She's a teenage girl. I guess, yeah. But she but doesn't Godai, care. Godai doesn't think of her as anything except the little sister figure. Yeah, like, basically. Like, he thinks of everyone. <laughs> Ichijo Even is Ichijo. his sister. <laughs> <laughs> My, um, I don't think... A, I don't... a friend of mine went to... Uh, yeah, my friend my went fr- to fanfiction.net. <laughs> so I just and I went there for a friend. I was just looking. He wanted me to find. <laughs> this is actually a friend of mine. I would never fucking step foot on fanfiction.net. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Continue. We all believe you. Continue. Okay, as long as everyone believes me. Okay, yeah. And the no- like the number one pairing, or no- number one is AG and the Birdman uh, from O's. Bank? Ankh, yeah. yeah. But, like, number two is Godai and Ichijo in like Common Rider. Like a gay thing, or...? Uh, no, like, a love thing. Yes, a gay <laughs> thing, <laughs> idiot. 
<laughs> have you ever even seen fan fiction on the internet? Yeah, I guess I shouldn't be surprised at all. I, I didn't get any romance vibes from those two either. No, they were buds. you can't be friends in things. No, I guess no one, yeah, you can't. If, if you have a large fan base, you cannot be friends. Everyone thinks you're no. fucking, regardless of... And they are, like, the bestest of friends by the end of the series. Yeah, yeah. They're, they have a very strong mutual respect for each other, for sure. But, like I said... Gay or straight, I could not see Godai having romantic feelings for anybody or anything. No, he's got some growing up to do. Maybe that world he traveling. Only, old... He only cares about protecting smiles and going on boken. And learning 2,000 skills by the year 2000. <laughs> I wonder if he did. I think he, I think he learned his 2,000 skill around like episode 40-something. His 2,000 skill should have been being a Kuga man. That would have been that would have been a great ending to that plot arc. His two thousand skill would be being a true hero or something like that. Yeah, that'd be kind of cheesy, but I would love it. That's what's going to happen in Ghost. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see about wah, Ghost. Wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, Kuga's middle part I think is the sticking point. Like that's remember the joke came around that like oh Liam's going to take forever to finish Kuga. Yeah, I was and he I did. was like in the thirties or something during that, and I just I was like one episode every two weeks. Like oh I guess it was I'll watch like Kuga. fucking six weeks later. <laughs> You finished that shit. It was so slow, but then once you get into, like, the 40s, it starts becoming way easier to shotgun because Daguva shows up, and the show starts to get yeah. going towards its conclusion, and that bat asshole starts to, like, chase after the power of Daguva, and everyone starts to sort of, like, it, it, it builds. It begins building, and Kuga's ending is, is good. I have problems with it. Really? It's not perfect, but it is... Well, nothing is perfect. Okay, yeah, but I have I have gripes. It's not What's your gripe. What is my gripe? Okay, it's there's this one part when Kuga gets uh he's he's about to get ultimate form, right? Okay. And Daguva shows up. At the end of one episode he says something, Kuga beats a monster, and then Daguva is like talking to uh, I think it's B one on top of a building, and he's like, I'm here and it, I'm gonna fuck shit up. And then at the beginning of the next episode, the show has skipped over a fight between Godai and Daguva, and, like, you see it in, like, these vague, brief flashbacks, and then the show just treats it like you've seen it the whole thing. And mm. Godai's, like, in the hospital, and they're like, oh, he sustained so many wounds during that fight. I understand why that was done. And why is that? Because the Godai versus Daguva fight was supposed to be, like, the big payoff of the whole series. Yeah, but... And showing, showing it twice... I think might devalue it a bit. I think I'm I'm with you on this though, and that they should have shown the fight. Okay, you're with me, but I'm not with you. I think if Daguva and Kuga fight, what the fuck does that? Mean? I don't I don't know, man. I disagree with what you just said. I think if Daguva and Kuga fight, and Kuga gets his fucking ass kicked, just like like uh, Empire Strikes Back, right? Luke fights Vader. Luke gets his hand cut off. Spoilers. He gets his ass kicked. And it becomes well, this is the spoiler, <laughs> and it becomes all the more satisfying when he overcomes it later, right? It it it, it adds more weight to the to the victory yeah, later. I was, I was playing devil's advocate. If you didn't pick that up, shit face, I said I agree with you. They should have shown the fight. <laughs> you were playing devil's advocate. I and... was playing common rider devil's advocate. <laughs> and from what they show, it's a cool fight. Like he's he's laughing and he's like, "Oh, where's your smile now, Kuga? Why don't you give me a smile, huh, bitch?" And he's like, he's. Saying that shit, and he's like, he's like, just thinking, and all the cars are lighting on fire around him. But I like, I, I, watching the flashback, I was like, I want to fucking see that. Why didn't you show me, you motherfuckers? Budgetary restraints. Budgetary I would imagine. restraints. Perhaps some time restrictions. Something went drastically wrong during shooting, and they were like, just, just cut it out or something. I don't know. I feel like it's probably it was purposeful. They thought that only showing the one fight would be a better payoff than showing two of them. Like they didn't want to show Dagobah's strength. That early, maybe? I don't know. Well, they were wrong. That's a shame. I agree. They really should have shown that fight. That's, that's, uh, like, it's just one thing that I don't like about the ending of Kuga, but it's such a huge sticking point to me, because it's such a huge plot point in the show, is their first fight, and it, they, it just, the show just fucks it. It's, it's just not done very well. It's, it loses a lot of its weight. It feels limp. Mm, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't think it's that big of a problem. I think it's a big problem. I think. I think. I think, I think it detracts certainly, and it detracts heavily. But I don't think it's like the end of the world type situation for the series. It's literally the end of the world. It's a strong mishandling. What did you think about the actual final confrontation, though? Because this is a sticking point between uh, Kamen Rider Kuga fans and idiots. How did you feel about it? <laughs> 
I loved it. I, I adored it, actually. It wasn't overly flashy. It wasn't overly uh, complex. It was simple. They light each other on fire. They punch the holy fuck out of each other in the snow. And then it cuts. And Kuga has won. It's, I love it. It's perfect. So you are not an idiot. There's actually Good. a lot I'm of people... I'm glad I have the Jeff not an idiot stamp. <laughs> There are a lot of people in the comments section of Facebook videos of the final <laughs> episodes of Kuga. The, the main audience for Kamen Rider Facebook that are, commentators. That are complaining quite heavily about how unaction packed that scene is and how it should have had them using their powers all out. Mm, I think that would have detracted. Like, the tone of Kuga is that it's gritty mm. and it's realistic. And I think having them do all, like, using full maximum use of their forms would have detracted a little bit from that. It doesn't feel natural as them just, like, fucking rolling around in the snow and just beating the holy hell out of each other. It's... They're so evenly matched at this point. Yeah. That any number... Like, there's only a few strikes before both of them are even thrown out of their fucking forms. Yeah, and they're both They pretty much destroy one another's belts straight out because they're not... Stupid. They're all bloodied and tired and slouched over, and Kuga's crying and Dagova's laughing, and it's a good scene, and their characters are on full display. I don't care if the, the fight choreography isn't the most complex. I thought it was brutal as fuck. I yeah, really absolutely. loved it. Yeah. And, like, I was talking about cinematography earlier. That is a gorgeous fucking fight scene with the snowstorm happening. It's it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. Especially, like, the long shot when they start walking towards each other. Yeah. And they're both on fire. They both light each other on fire. Because they have... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, like, great. force... They, like, force of will the fire away and then start running towards each other. Yeah. Oh, it's such a But cool I mean, scene. like, the long shot where they're standing really far apart and they just slowly start walking towards each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you see is, like, the black of Ultimate Kuga and, like, the gold parts of Daguva walking towards each other. Yeah. Oh, it's so neat. It really is. It's a beautiful scene. Oh, I have another problem. Uh-oh. With the final part of Kuga. During the course of the series, the Gronky kill... So it's fucking, like, tens of thousands of people just scattered over the course of the series. They kill so many people. Mm-hmm. Just, like, in and around Tokyo. And yet you don't really ever see the effects of that. Like, people are still going to school and going to work and walking around and still all crowded and stuff. I think if they had had... There has to be people walking around for the Grongi to kill. Yeah, but I think if they had had just one scene or something, one or two scenes, where, like, maybe Ichijo is driving somewhere and he passes by an abandoned apartment building or something, and someone's like, oh, you know, there were two Grongi attacks close to there and everyone just cleared out. Like, every like half the police died and everyone else left because they didn't want to be close anymore or something. Just That's like actually some... one of my... That's one of my gripes about pretty much every Kamen Rider series that has monsters attacking people. Because it never feels like a crisis. No, the only series that ever felt like a crisis, and it had to get to the point where, like, the United States is nuked, (laughs) is Gaim. Yeah, I guess spoilers, everybody in the U.S. dies in Gaim. Yeah, we're all fucking dead (laughs) in the Gaim universe. Canada's safe, though, everything's fine over here. No, Canada gets nuked. No, they just shoot it back at, they shoot it back at Jeff's house. Okay. Like, fuck this guy. How, how much has Jeff spent on Kamen Rider Gaim toys? <laughs> Not enough! <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's a big sticking point I've had with everything in Rider, and I think it's just something I had to get used to at some point. It's a shame. It's a shame. Because I mean, like, there are monsters fucking killing people all over the place in Blade. They're just murdering the fuck out of people. Mm-hmm. And people just go about their business. Yeah. I guess it's not it's not as bad, I think, in other series because they don't give you numbers. But in yeah. Kuga they're like, But I mean there's a fucking people. like there's an alien invasion happening in Kabuto to the point where they everybody needs that necklace to Oh, that's true. And like throughout the whole series, people are just like going to restaurants and fucking walking around, having a good time. Yeah, and it takes place like ten years after the invasion too. And it's yeah, just... the invasion has been going on this whole time, and it's time. still there. And society doesn't really seem to have changed in any meaningful way, other than nobody goes back to Shibuya ever. Yeah, but I don't know. It's just and it... in, in Kuga, it really is the numeration that causes the problem. Like in in Kabuto, it could be that there's only an attack by the worms once every like year. <laughs> Man, those episodes something. are spaced out real far apart. <laughs> like to, before the first episode. Oh, before okay, yeah, yeah. 
and uh, that might be why people are going about their business. But in Kuga, like, hey, did you hear three blocks over that like nine hundred thousand people died yesterday? <laughs> nine hundred thousand people. Let's go out and get some ramen. Nine hundred thousand <laughs> people converged on one location, and then they were all killed <laughs> by like an owl grungy or something. <laughs> Anyways, out to school. Let's go get some ramen. <laughs> let's go to the mall. Let's get some. Let's go see a movie. Let's go converge with hundreds of people at the mall. <laughs> hey, you want to go swimming? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what scumbags the Gronky are! They're fucking awful. I love them. I love. I love scumbag, awful, irredeemable villains. Like, I like a good complex villain more. Yeah. But I love with all my heart a villain who's just like I'm just a fucking prick on the deepest most ultimate level i'm just a scummy disgusting thing and i feel like you would like this is neither here nor there with what we're talking about but i feel like you would like black manta oh he's like aquaman's, yeah, aquaman's villain. guy like aquaman is he's been like tormenting aquaman for fucking like months or whatever he like spoilers killed aquaman's son <laughs> and cut his fucking arm off this is the dc comic spoiler cast and aquaman is like why are you doing this? And he's like, because I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like your face, sir. He's he's like, because I hate you. You're, you're, you're just awful. I hate you. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> what an asshole. He's just a huge fucking asshole. That's great. That's so great. It's like, um, I guess I just finished Jessica Jones. Kilgrave and Jessica Jones is kind of the same. He's just such a... Fuck. Uh, he's just a big fucking racist. He's just a, he's like a huge baby who's so used to getting what he wants. <laughs> he I love is. him. I I don't know if you're allowed to say you love a rapist, Liam. <laughs> I love the idea. I love him as a character, as a villain. He's great. I thought that was like uh, we're not gonna talk. Let's about not that talk about Jessica Jones. It was a, it was a decent show. It was all right. It wasn't. It was no Daredevil. It was no Kuga. It was no Common Rider Kuga. <laughs> Um, yeah, those are the two big gripes I have with Kuga's ending. Otherwise, I really, really like the final fight. I really, really love the last episode. The last episode is, like, I can understand where people get his Mary Sue-ness from, that last episode. Yeah. Because everyone in that episode is like, I fucking love this guy. <laughs> but he's, he's had the time. best, but the he's thing, earned that shit. The, yeah, the thing about a Mary Sue is they like the, they like the character right away, and for, for no, no good reason. reason. But yeah. Kuga, he fucking saved the world. Of course they're gonna like him, and he's a nice guy. I feel like... It's unbelievably unrealistic when a character saves the world and nobody gives a shit about them. Yeah. Like, that happens in the movie of Blade. Like, after the world's been saved or whatever, uh, Kenzaki becomes like a fucking trash man and nobody remembers him. <laughs> and, He's like, they're like, yo, what are your credentials for this job of working at McDonald's? He's like, I saved the world once. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, get a mop. And like... They meet the new generation riders, like Mr. Beautiful Face. Oh, is this Missing Ace? Yeah, Missing Ace. Like, Mr. Beautiful Face, who smiles a lot. Yeah, that that beautiful man. He, like, they just shit all over him. (laughs) And call him, like, an old-timer and say his time's over and everything. And I'm like, you only exist because of this guy. Shouldn't this fucker be getting, like, a congressional medal and money for life or something like that? (laughs) And it's fucked up because, like, the dude who drinks milk all the time, the guy who's completely useless the entire series, becomes, like, a billionaire from selling a book about the common Riders. <laughs> Guess Blade should have thought of that, asshole. Blade's a fucking, like, he picks up trash for a living, which is a very <laughs> noble thing. But everybody just shits on him. Uh, yeah, well, being Boy, a trash man pays. It's a civil yeah. servant job. It pays pretty well. I think this is what we said last time we talked about. Yeah, it. he's he's at like at the end of Kuga. Kuga becomes a vagabond again. He loves to be. He loves to travel. Kuga ends with a. Uh, I remember somebody emailed us like two weeks, a week or two before I finished Kuga, and they said, "How would you change Gaim's ending if you could change it and couldn't just erase it?" And I said. No henshins, no fights. Just show us where yeah. everyone is, like, six months. It would be like a Kuga ending. It's a, and then I watched Kuga's ending, and I was like, oh, well, what about it? This is exactly what I wanted out of Gaim's ending. And it's like three months later. No fights, just this is where everyone's at, and this is where Kuga's at, and he's still... Yeah, it shows It shows how Godai affected all of their lives. Yeah. 
and what happened afterwards, and it dances around showing what Godai's up to this whole time. Everybody just says he's off on an adventure. Yeah, you see a couple of little shots of him on the beach, but, like, never, nothing... It never shows his face. Yeah, not until the very end. And he's still Godai. The, the Godai we know. He, like, runs off to stop kids fighting and uh, juggles, juggles yeah. to entertain them. The power of the belt did not corrupt him is the big uh, payoff of that episode, which is great. It was It was everything it needed to be. Perfect send off, and you get to hear Godai speak Spanish, <laughs> which is nice. Oh, uh, it's always good. You get to hear, you get to see children who are not Japanese and have shock and awe when a non-Japanese person appears in Common Rider. Just like, That's always strange. Like even when people go to other countries or other worlds, everyone's Japanese in Tokusatsu. <laughs> everybody there is Japanese. <laughs> They all speak Japanese. Like, that's my favorite part of the Space Sheriff movies, is that everyone in space speaks Japanese. <laughs> it's like Star Trek. And everyone who's in space and a human being is Japanese. Of course. That's like every time Jean was on screen, it was like getting kicked in the face. You're like, holy shit, a white guy. And he's what speaking English, fuck? too. He comes, he's like, hello, good morning. And you're like, ah! like, oh my god, I'm not Japanese, I, I forgot. Watching? I must have put in my DVD of CSI by mistake, there's a white guy here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love in, like, martial arts movies, like, the martial arts guy will be kicking everybody's ass, and then, like, a wall will slide open or something, and just a big fucking giant white wrestler <laughs> yeah. will walk in. Yeah, in American movies, like, in American action movies, they fight a big Russian in America, or in, uh, like, Kung Fu movies, they fight a big American. That's how it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, in Game of Death, the Bruce Lee movie, he fights fucking Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> it's great. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar kicks him in the chest, and it leaves a footprint on his chest. Oh, my God. his entire midsection <laughs> size. It's so great. That's awesome. Just seeing Jean for the first time in Kugo, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> He was such a weird. He was he was a cool guy. I liked him. Yeah, he was a good dude. He was he was he was just like all of Kuga's supporting cast. I terribly enjoyed Jean. It seemed like he wasn't going to be a real supporting character to begin with. Like he was just there to show up and say good morning. Yeah, but he 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 does a lot of work on Gorom, and I think they made him involved with Enokita towards the end just to kind of give him something to do. Like he, yeah. he just suddenly cares about this kid because he says his parents also kind of neglected him, which is good enough. Yeah, that's a good enough reason to try and help a kid out. Yeah, so it's, it's they kept him they kept him up for the whole series. He was good. He's actually uh, fairly decent at speaking Japanese. It sounds like as well, which is not so common <laughs> yeah. in common writer. Not so common. I just made that joke. Oh, shit! I, I know. I just it, it wasn't obvious enough. I decided. I hate would... you. Okay. I fucking hate you. Okay. Anyway, like, like in, um, Cure Uger? Don't ask me. I don't watch Sentai. Mm. There was a white guy in Cure well, Uger, anyway, I know. I don't, fuck that part. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk about Shinkinger instead with Richard Brown. Oh, Shinkin Brown. Rich, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Shinkin Brown, Shinkin quote Brown. unquote. Richard Brown is a, a character, a guy who speaks fluent fucking Japanese perfectly, and they made him speak it stiltedly, <laughs> like he didn't understand it well. It's like, hey, uh, everybody in the U.S. who watches this show, this is what we think of you. Here, oh, spe here you <laughs> speaking of that shit, there's a dude in Forze who's half white. Yeah. And he plays, uh, like, the football star. Mm -hmm. And... He has to disguise himself as an American, okay. and he wears this ratty blonde wig and this giant fucking fake nose <laughs> to be an American. I was oh, like, I'm offended as fuck. I love that that shit is still acceptable over there. That's my favorite. <laughs> I was offended as fuck. I feel like he should be too. Now you He's know what it's white. like on the other side. <laughs> I, are you calling me a racist right now? Yeah. This yeah, is what basically. you get for being a racist, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Everybody knows who listens to this podcast knows that Jeff is a blatant racist. I just cannot allow Canadians in <laughs> front of me. I'm sorry. They, Canadians are inferior in everything they do. They are. Canadians are the inferior race. Oh. They have poor Canadian genes that have been frozen in the Great White North. <laughs> the genes taste like maple syrup if you lick them. Oh, we're going for that low-hanging fruit, are we? You already made a joke about colds. Maple syrup! Ma oh. Hockey! 
polar bears. Hang on, friend. You started this train. You started talking about the cold weather. That's it. That's how it always starts. I can go anywhere from there, and it's always up. So fuck you. It's always up north. That was... Oh, fuck you. Seriously. Are we done talking about Kuga? It was a very good show. I actually wanted to talk about Kuga's design. Is It's a very simple design. It's just a chess piece and a helmet and then the glove parts and the boot parts and that's it. Yeah, it's very curvy, it's very simplistic, it's very slick. It's it's very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. And it's very simple and it's one of my favorite rider designs for that reason. It's it's like super modular in a way because it changes shape constantly throughout the series. Yeah. In each new form and each form is ex- like immediately recognizable as Kuga. Yeah, you can his head stays the same, so you always have the horns and the eyes and the mouth and you can see but even the chest parts they still sort of keep a a, a sort of theme of like that segmented chest yeah. even when the, the segments change shape and stuff like that. You can I, still kind of tell. It's, I absolutely it's a very nice... love Kuga's design, Agito's design as well. Oh, yeah. And I think they complement each other so well, and I'm just fucking... I'm going to lament until my dying day that they never did a crossover with Kuga and Agito. Yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. And I understand why. They talk about in a director's like summary or something of Agito that uh, they dropped it being a sequel to Kuga. Because it would make no sense for Godai to not come and fight the lords. Yeah, like right well. from the start, you think he'd be there. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be easy enough to just say he's in Cuba or something. <laughs> well, here's the thing. There was a bit at the end of Kuga where they talk about how the belt, um, Kuga's belt, if it detects you've become too powerful or too horrible or something, it turns to sand. And it doesn't yeah. turn to sand because Kuga's such a great guy. Yeah, it's the it's the Goram that yeah. does that. No, that's it's it's Goram. I thought it was the belt that did that. It's the it's the Goram because they they say it's still in police lockup and it's still whole. Oh shit! Okay, never mind. I'm mistaken. I could have said I I could have said something like oh it, he turned uh, ultimate and then the belt busted from the overflow of the power or something. Yeah, but I guess actually, I'm fucked up. They show the scans of four scans of the belt. It's like really um, it's subtle. But the belt is reforming in each of the scans. Yeah, it's it's getting more solid. So it's coming back. Yeah. And they talk about in, like, director's materials about Kuga that the belt survived and it's just being fixed yeah. as time goes along. It could have been, like, he, you know, it took him a while for it to get fixed. He doesn't show up until, yeah. like, 30 or something. I don't know. They could have just had him show up in, like, a movie or something or something afterwards. I would have taken anything, but I guess we'll have to yeah. take the PS2 game. Oh. Uh, <laughs> take the card game that has both of them. <laughs> uh, well, card games can be fun. No, they can't. Po- the Pokemon card game on the Game Boy was pretty fun. Yeah, it was alright. It was pretty cool. Pretty bad. I'd rather just play Pokemon. I guess, yeah. I'd rather play a Kamen Rider card game. Yeah. Yeah. There is a Kamen Rider card game. Which? It's don't say Gamberizing. Don't say fucking Gamberizing. It's not a it's card game. Gamberizing. You don't have, like, a hand, and you don't play cards. You it's just... a it's a game that you play with cards. <sighs> You're a... It's not, it's not like a deck-building game, you know what I mean? No, it's, it's not, not like, a deck-building like game. Magic the Gathering or anything like that. The problem with that is, what the fuck do you do for a card game for Kamen Rider? Like, you Here's can't... what you do. You rip off uh, UFS. You ever play what's, UFS? What's UFS? Oh, it's such a cool... Okay, it's like a card game Ultimate where you just Ultimate fighting ha- shit? Universal fighting system. You, oh. have, you have one... Picture this, okay? You have one rider, right? Your deck... You don't have multiple riders. Say your deck is a Kamen Rider Joker deck. Okay. And you put out Kamen Rider Joker, and he's your fighter. He's always on the field or whatever, and then you, like, play moves for him and stuff. You play, like, a kick, or you play a power-up, or something like that. And that's how you play the game. I think that'd be sick. Cool. There you that go. Be pretty cool. There you go, Bandai. There's one for free. Why don't you develop that shit? <laughs> I should. You're not doing anything with your life. Kickstarter, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> the Rider Club Radio Common Rider Card Game. Oh. Order today. Oh boy. It's just a fucking ripoff of UFS, so. <laughs> 100% original content. <laughs> Maybe you'd build a Kuga deck. Oh. Kuga was great. That's, that's... Kuga's a good series. I, w- I wouldn't give it a 10 out of 10 because of how slow it gets in the center. It's very draggy. 
Yeah. What would you give it if you had to give it an out of 10? I would give it a solid 7.75. What, what the fuck kind of point <laughs> systems? I'll give it an 8. I'll an give eight. it an 8. That's, I agree. I'll round I'll, up. I would give it an 8 or a 9. Okay. i give it an 8.5. I, eight, eight point five, somewhere I would in not there. entertain giving it a 9, but I would definitely give it a solid 8. It's it's as high up on the list of Kamen Rider series as I feel like Kamen Rider can get thus oh, far. So would you say it's your favorite then? It's, it's really hard for me to choose between it and... And a couple other series. Okay. Like, I know you like Double a lot. and uh... I do like Double a lot. It's It's been five years since I saw Kuga all the way through. It's yeah. been... Actually, it's been four years since I saw Kuga all the way through. It's been five or six since I saw Double all the way through. So oh. You've been in this shit for a while, haven't you? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to hang up my fucking DVD player. Hang up your DVD? <laughs> what, are you going to tie a rope to it or something? Uh, okay, that's Kuga. I hate you. Can we talk about episode one of Agito now? Yeah, go right ahead. So I finally finished Jessica Jones, and I started watching episode one of Agito. I just seen episode one last night, and I thought it was a very, very strong first episode. Actually, I thought it was great so it far. It was a very strong first episode. It introduces the characters that you need to know, and it, it gives a lot of focus to the secondary already. Yeah, I love Hikawa. I love Hikawa. is a great character. He's he's kind of the hapless everyman. Yeah, I like I like that character in Ryder. It's the same reason everyone likes Kagami so much, right? Yeah. Hikawa's kinda of like the company man. He's got the suit. He's 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 the I love the the whole G three team too. Like when he puts on oh, the yeah. G three suit and then the monster appears and they're like, Oh shit. Oh shit, we get to try G three and they're like, Well we don't have permission. They're like, I don't give a fuck, just send it out. <laughs> Hikawa, get ready. And they, they, they're just so excited about it, and Nikawa is so excited about it, and then he just gets his ass handed to him, which is my yeah. favorite part. The secondary is G3, G3 looks cool. Wait until he gets to G3X. Oh my god. No, I know what G3X looks like. It's the most badass G3X suit. is fucking amazing. But, like, I love that he's... It's like, it, it's this very strong contrast of technology and magic. Yeah. And technology is just nothing compared to the magic. And technology it, has a long way to go before it can reach the same level as yeah, magic. Yeah, because it takes Agito. Agito appears and just destroys the monster that kicked G3's ass in like two seconds. And it's a really cool scene. How do you feel about Shoichi as a character so far? Uh, I don't have enough of a grasp on Shoichi yet. He's All I know is that he's kind of a goof, just like Kuga. He's got he amnesia, is. and he's, he's unusually like... good at farming. He's un he's like a goof like Kuga, but even more so. Like I wouldn't call Godai dumb. Yeah. But I might call Shoichi dumb. Okay. <laughs> he's not stupid. He's just kinda slow. Okay. The only thing I know he's, about He's a really good guy, and he's he just has this worldview that's so simplistic. Mm, I know about Good Eats Smooth Poops. <laughs> and I know he runs a restaurant in Ryuki. I remember that part in the the movie. Yeah, he loves to cook. Yeah. He's a great chef. Yeah. And I actually... A lot of people complain that Shoichi doesn't seem like he's Agito. Like, when he transforms, it's like an entirely different character. But that's like a plot point. Oh. That, like, Agito is... Whoa, don't fucking tell me, mate. I'm, uh, I'm only on episode one. It's not, like, spelled out, buddy. It's not, okay, like, a thing okay. that they they say later. Okay, fine. But uh, Agito is, like, he runs on pure instinct mm. when he's Agito. And he he just, like, he's overtaken by it, almost. Yeah. And I, I actually really enjoyed that. Okay. that's I'm, I'm very, very excited to keep watching Agito. The first episode was pretty strong, so. Too bad he dies! <gasps> I want to see more... He uh, gets shot eight times by Ichijo. <laughs> Ichijo shows up with the special bullets and <laughs> shoots the gas bullets in him, and that's the end of Agito. Good job. The, the unidentified life forms are back! He looks like a Grongi. Well, he looks like Kuga. But he looks like Kuga. I'm sure someone would see that and be like, holy shit, they're back. That's what they do say in the first episode. <laughs> When they talk about the lords. Yeah, they, they they call them unidentified life forms a couple times. Yeah, they decide to call them unknown yeah, by the unknown end of the episode. In English. It's pretty good, though. I can't wait to see it. It's it's going to be a cool show, I think. You know how like, there's a lot of focus on uh, Kuga's forms? Yeah. 
Agito has forms as well, but they just sort of happen, and nobody comments on them. <laughs> okay, that's kind of weird. Yeah, I, it's just a natural progression of his powers, I guess. Okay. They talk about him getting stronger, but they don't ever really mention him changing forms much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his forms aren't really visually distinctive. Yeah, okay. I'll be prepared for that. I'll brace myself. But it's it's about the characters in Agito as well, and they... Because the three main characters are all riders. Yeah. The I assume Ryo is, is Gills? Yeah. Yeah. The focus on them is uh you can see them grow as characters and also they're fighting and stuff, and yeah. the writers felt a lot more uh comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm fucking excited to watch a series that's got more than one writer again. I missed that. With Kuga. It's, I actually feel like Kuga's a breath of fresh air in that way. Yeah, I guess I get so used to Heisei. It's true, but I like lots of writers. You know me. I like I like I like I like two writers. I like a shit. Which load. hardly ever happens. I like at least ten or else the show sucks. Oh my god. <laughs> Not many Kamen Rider shows are good in my opinion. Oh my god. <laughs> I think if you have more than four, that 99% of the rest of them ain't gonna get shit focus on them whatsoever. Well, if you make the plot all about all the riders and not have um, any monsters of the week, you can do it. I really feel like most of the Ryuki riders are completely unmemorable. Well, the ones like, uh fucking scissors and them that have one arc and then they're done. Is, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're just meant to be like... They're completely unmemorable. They're just meant to be villains of the arc and then they're gone. Which I yeah. think is a pretty good way to use them if you're gonna the have only, that many. The only writers I really remember are like uh, Oja, Zelda, and uh, Raya. Besides Knight and... Uh, what about what about Ryuhi. Odin? You remember Odin? Oh, fuck Odin. What? What's the matter with Odin? I mean, he's dumb, Odin's but... so fucking cool. He's dumb, but he's, like, all over the show. How could you forget Odin? I guess I remember him. I didn't think of him just then. I guess you didn't remember him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I remember him now that you've reminded me. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was the Cougar... Cougar... The Cougar... Cougar! The Cougar spoiler cast, everyone. <laughs> They're very dangerous. Stay out of the woods. <laughs> I have a I have a bad history recently with mispronouncing and misspelling writer names, but hopefully I'll get past it. <laughs> Are you gonna tell our viewers about that or listeners? Uh, no, no, actually, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> good night, everyone. Everybody have a good week. If you want to send us an email, you can at riderclubradio at gmail.com. You can talk to us on Twitter, where you can see Liam type a bunch of shit drunkenly sometimes, at Rider Club Radio. <laughs> you might catch that if you're lucky. <laughs> if I get home and I'm a little shaken up and I'm feeling frisky. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just interact with us anyway. You can send your questions anywhere and we'll answer them on the show or we'll answer them right there. Okay. Uh, thanks for tuning in for the spoiler cast. You might get a Ryuki spoiler cast or an Agito spoiler cast in the next couple years. <laughs> I think Ryuki's next on my on my list of what I want a spoiler cast. All right, uh, tune in next week where we probably talk about Kamen Rider Ghost. If all goes well. See ya. Bye. <laughs>